All right, guys, in this video, we're going to take a look at the coolant setup on the 370, because if you remember, that's one thing we had a lot of problems with in this car, in the 350. Once we went twin turbo, we had a lot of issues with the engine coolant system. It would overheat all the time, it would need re-bleeding all the time, it'd be spitting coolant out onto the floor, and we never really got to the bottom of a lot of the problems, but I think we've kind of figured a few things out now, and with the 370, we're just kind of taking a belt and braces approach, and we're just throwing everything at it that could possibly give it a good chance of working well as a cooling system. So we've probably gone a bit overboard, um, but to explain all the changes, rather than me just showing you, like me making the new expansion tanks and stuff, and not really explain it very well, I've made a little thing on the PC yesterday, I did a little diagram of the old cooling system versus the new cooling system, and talked through all like the basics of, of how a cooling system works and why we're changing certain things. And some of it might be a little bit patronizing at the start if you already know kind of the basics of this sort of stuff. But I think there's probably a few things in there that you might learn. I know I certainly learned a lot about this as I've been going through it all with Bryn. That's where I've kind of got all this from. It's, I'm pretty much just regurgitating what Bryn's told me. So I can't take any credit for this. At the same time, if it all turns out to be wrong, blame Bryn, you know? But yeah, I'll play that for you now. And then we'll come back to me actually making some of the stuff that I talked about in the video. So this lovely diagram that I've created, these incredible graphics here, <laughs> this is basically how the old coolant setup worked on the 350. In reality, it was actually a little bit more complex than this because we were water cooling the turbos, so it actually looked more like this. But I don't want to confuse things and make it harder to follow when I'm explaining the basics and the fundamentals, so we'll just pretend it all looked like this because for all intents and purposes, this is how it worked. And also this is how a lot of car coolant systems work from the factory. And the only other thing that I want to say um, before we get into this is that this whole, let's call it, educational section of the video uh, will probably go on for quite a while because there's quite a lot of things to explain. So if that doesn't interest you and you just want to see me and Bryn dicking about and swearing a lot and making a fool of ourselves as usual, uh, there will be plenty of that later on in the video. So just skip past all this stuff if you don't care about that. So the first thing that we need to understand before we go any further is that as coolant heats up, it expands. So obviously the coolant starts off cold and we start off with the whole system at atmospheric pressure. And as the coolant heats up, it expands and increases the pressure until we get to the limit that is on our radiator cap. So in this case, 1.2 bar. The stock system was like 0.9 bar. I'll explain in a minute why we raise that and what we're trying to do with that. When we hit that pressure, the coolant is allowed to flow out of there and into the expansion tank until it brings us back below the 1.2 bar pressure. So obviously as that's happening, this is filling the expansion tank up. Hopefully you don't actually fill it all the way to the top and then dump it out. Vent to atmosphere is just kind of a nice way of saying dump it on the floor. So when the system's hot, why do we want there to be any pressure in it? Why do we have this 1.2 bar cap? Why do we have any kind of pressure cap on there? Well, to put it simply, the higher the pressure, the higher the boiling point. And we don't want the coolant to boil because boiling introduces air bubbles, essentially. I think the proper name for it is cavitation, but basically just means air bubbles, and that's bad. Now, I figured it would probably be a good idea to show exactly how the pressure does actually affect the boiling point. So here you go, have a graph, obviously not made by me. One thing to bear in mind, though, with this graph is that 1.0 at the bottom there on the atmospheric pressure scale, that is just normal atmospheric pressure. So as you can see, water boils at 100 degrees there. So when I'm talking about like a 0.9 bar cap, that means 0.9 bar above atmospheric pressure. So on the graph, it would actually be here at like 1.9. And when I'm talking about 1.2 bar cap, that would actually be 2.2. So yeah, even at those relatively low numbers, you're getting a decent amount of extra temperature before the coolant starts to boil. Something that you might notice on this graph as well is that this is the boiling point of water, not of coolant, because generally coolant means you know, like an antifreeze mixture. Um, what's it called, like ethylol glycol or ethylene glycol, something like that. Generally, when people say coolant, they mean that. But in this coolant system, we're going to be mostly using water. Um, and we'll still have a little bit of antifreeze just in case I get lazy over winter and don't dump all the coolant out. But yeah, we'll run a lot less antifreeze than a normal road car would. And the reason for that is water is actually a lot better at absorbing heat and taking it away from the engine than coolant is. So why don't we just run pure water, just 100% water? Well, there's a few things that we need from coolant, such as lubrication for the water pump and seals and things on there. Um, if you've ever got coolant on your fingers, you know it's kind of slippery, whereas water isn't. There's also corrosion inhibitors and things like that. Whereas if you just ran pure water in your engine, you're going to start to corrode things and everything's going to get pretty nasty pretty quickly. So the solution, if we want to run mostly water or 100% water, is to add an additive like water wetter. You might have seen this stuff mentioned or heard about it, and I think it gets a bit misunderstood, probably because of their marketing. But if we look at this graph that they provide, you can see that this line here represents kind of your average coolant mixture, which is, you know, 50% water, 50% antifreeze or whatever you want to call it. And the line just below it, so barely any different in terms of temperature, is that same 50-50 mix, but with water wetter added. 
So you can see it's not really doing a lot just adding water wetter. The time when we get a big drop in temperature is when we switch to water. So these two lines down here, the first one is just pure water. So with no additives whatsoever, just pure water is way better than like a 50% coolant mix with water wetter. Um, and then the line just below it is that same just pure water, but with water wetter added. So as you can see, just adding water wetter to something doesn't really improve the temperatures much. What it's allowing us to do though, is to run more water instead of coolant or glycol and get the benefits that we would get from glycol like lubrication and corrosion inhibitor stuff. So anyway, sorry that was a bit of a long tangent there, but I feel like this is the only place it really made sense to explain it. So let's get back to what we're talking about, which is the pressure on this cap. So we're saying that we've got a 1.2 bar pressure cap here to give us a higher boiling point. But if more pressure is more good, why don't we just have like a five bar cap on here instead? Well, there's a few reasons. One, it's just gonna put more strain on everything. So everywhere that there's a join in the coolant system, which is quite a lot of places when you think about it, you know, all these silicon couplers, everywhere that anything comes off the coolant system is now gonna be under a lot more strain, a lot more pressure trying to burst through it. The water pump is gonna be fighting against that extra pressure as well now. However, if you do have a really high pressure cap, like that's higher than the coolant system would ever actually get to, then no coolant is ever gonna be trying to actually expand out into the expansion tank. So you don't even need one at that point, which would avoid the problem that we had. And the problem that we had is that we'd hit this 1.2 bar of pressure, it would overflow into the expansion tank and gradually that expansion tank would fill up and it would actually overflow in our case. So the expansion tank basically wasn't big enough. If you've ever seen my engine bay in the 350, you know how tight it was for space. And the expansion tank that I made was pretty much as big as I could make it and still fit everything in. So what would happen is we would fill that expansion tank completely. It would start to overflow onto the floor, which is not actually a problem at that point. I mean, it's a bit messy, sure, but it's not actually causing any issues at that point. The problem comes when everything cools down. So we turn the car off, everything would start to cool down, everything starts to contract, and it starts to try and suck coolant back in through the uh, radiator cap where it was expanding out of before. But because we've actually lost some coolant because it overflowed, but then it's gonna to get to the point where there's no coolant left for it to suck in because again, there's less than it started with because some of it overflowed onto the floor. So then it's just gonna start sucking in air and that's what causes a lot of problems. And that did happen to me a lot before. Like we'd go and do a drift day and everything would be okay. It would get really hot, but it would be okay. And then we'd come back, you know, everything would cool down. A few weeks later, I'd go and do another drift day and then we'd have a load of problems. There'd be like air locks everywhere and it'd need re bleeding for ages and there'd be coolant missing and stuff. And it, it was just a pain in the ass. And I think that all pretty much comes down to just not having a big enough expansion tank. So this is the setup that we're gonna use in the 370. And we've kind of just thrown everything at this to make sure we don't have any coolant issues. Like I'm gonna be really annoyed if we still have problems after all this. So the main difference with this setup is that we've got a header tank instead of just an overflow or expansion tank. We've got an electric water pump which is basically just because we've gone rear mounted radiator. The radiator before was in the front and it didn't have a very good setup at all. Like there was a lot of stuff in the way of it and there wasn't any good ducting going to it. So it had a pretty hard time even just cooling the coolant down anyway, before we even got into all the other problems. So like I said, one of the main differences here is that we've got a header tank instead of an expansion tank. And it might not be obvious at first what the difference is, but let's take a look back at the old setup where the pressure cap is on the radiator, not on the tank itself. It doesn't have to be on the radiator, it could be pretty much anywhere in the system as long as it's not on the, the tank. So the expansion tank itself is never under any pressure, it just is literally a pot for coolant to overflow into and then get sucked back out of when the rest of the system requires it. Whereas on a header tank setup, the pressure cap is actually on the header tank itself. So we're still going to have all the expansion happen within this tank. So as you can see, it's like four litres in total capacity, but one litre of that, or maybe 1.5 litres, will just be air in the top of it. So we've made sure the tank's big enough to allow that expansion to happen without it actually completely filling the tank. So in theory, this vent to atmosphere here now should never be venting coolant. It should only just vent the air that was in the top of the header tank. And then when everything cools down, it can just suck air back in and that's fine because that's how the whole system's designed to work with air in the top. That does mean that the header tank has got to be the highest point in the system though, because we're gonna actually set you know, the water level in it. We want it to stay at that level until everything expands obviously. So yeah, we'll mount that nice and high in the boot somewhere near the rear radiator. We've also got these running bleeds coming from various high points in the system so that any air in them can just go and just end up as air in the top of this and all the coolant will just drip down into the bottom section that's full of coolant. And the whole thing just kind of constantly gets pulled around by the electric water pump sucking it in from the bottom of the header tank. But then another thing we've done to try and make sure we don't have any issues with anything boiling and causing capitation is we've got a swirl pot. 
The swirl pot I've already made and I've filmed a little thing explaining exactly how that works and what that does. So I'll show you that in a second. But there's one last thing that I want to talk about with the header tank relating to all this pressure stuff. And that is that we're going to add a little valve to the top of this, which is not shown on this diagram. But there'll be a little like car tire valve basically that we can use to manipulate the pressure in the whole system. So for a start, we could just stick a normal car tire pressure gauge on the valve and see what pressure the whole system's at, which would be useful to know in some situations. Also, if we ever need to relieve pressure in the system because we need to open the cap for some reason, we can just let pressure out using that valve. And then if we ever have relieved all the pressure in the system, we can use that valve to pump pressure back in, just again with a normal tire inflator. And the reason that's important is because remember at the start of this whole thing I said the coolant heating up and expanding is what causes this pressure in the first place and we want a bit of pressure for the boiling point stuff. Well if we ever relieve that pressure while the car's still hot, if we have to open this cap for some reason to check the coolant level or whatever, which we had to do a lot on the old system, we'd constantly be taking caps off to check coolant levels and stuff because of all the problems we had. But once you do that and the car's still hot, you've now got no pressure in the system and if you just put the cap back on and then go out and do some more laps, you've still got no pressure in the system because it's not the fact that it's hot that creates the pressure, it's the heating up, it's the expansion that creates the pressure. So once it's already expanded, once it's already hot, you don't gain any pressure again. So that then just makes the problems even worse because we've got a coolant system that's not working very well and stuff's boiling. Now we've relieved all the pressure, it's just going to boil even easier now. So that's kind of a, a vicious cycle there. So that's why on this header tank we're going to add a way that we can actually increase the pressure manually if we ever need to. Hopefully we won't need to do that because we won't be opening this cap when stuff's hot now because we won't have problems. But just in case, for the sake of welding on one fitting that we can thread a tyre valve into, we may as well do that and give ourselves the option. So yeah, hopefully that explains everything. Um, like I say, the swirl pot is the only thing we've not touched on, but I filmed something on that after I made it, so I'll show you that now. So this is the swirl pot, and this has just got a normal blanking cap on it. I think I already showed this, but yeah, this is just a blanking cap. It's not a um, pressurised cap. So that's got no spring in it like the other one has. This is literally just to keep a lid on it basically, but also be somewhere that we can take off and have a look in if we ever need to. So there'll just be coolant flowing out of here all the time, which is called a running bleed because it should be coolant, but if there's ever any air built up in here, the air can get out here nice and easily because it's right at the top. Um, and that brings me on to what a swirl port does, which is, as the name suggests, swirls the coolant around, which is why these come in at an angle. So if you can see from the top, the coolant's gonna come in there and it's gonna, because that's kind of in line with the curve of this pot, it's gonna swirl around. And because the exit is at the bottom as well, that also helps it swirl around. And in theory, what that does is swirls the coolant constantly, which means that you get a kind of whirlpool effect, which does two things. One of them is that the kind of centrifugal force, if you imagine if you just spin something round, it kind of, all the heavy stuff goes to the outside, the lighter stuff stays on the inside. Everyone's kind of familiar with that concept. The air is a lot lighter than the coolant, so the coolant gets flung to the outside, and in theory the air bubbles that are in there um, can sit in the inside and bubble up to the top and then come out of here, which again goes to the header tank and can then bleed off nice and easily and not get trapped in the whole system. And to be fair, I should have started with explaining that that's the whole purpose of a swirl pot, is to de-aerate the coolant. So if, if the coolant has actually started to boil anywhere in the system, when it comes into here, which is gonna be just before the radiator, so at this hottest point, basically, um, when it comes into here, this is to help get rid of any bubbles and send them out to the header tank instead of them just going back around into the engine through the radiator and everything. And then you get problems if you have air bubbles actually in your engine, obviously not good. So yeah, that's the idea of it. Hopefully it does its job and we don't have any more coolant issues, but we will see. I should also apologize as well for not filming making any of this, but yeah, there's a few um, pictures on my Instagram story that I'll flash up now and you can see the kind of progress that I made with it from start to finish. But yeah, sorry, I wasn't really in the, in the mood for filming anything at that point apparently. I'm fairly happy with how it turned out in terms of the welds. There's some bits that could be better as always, but for the most part, considering this is the first aluminium thing I've made for quite a while, it turned out okay. But yeah, now that that is done, we should probably make a start on the header tank. Remember this, remember hours of welding at this crappy welding bench that I made up, oh, nearly knocked you over there. We're back at it again. We are doing it all over again. Today's project is this header tank, which I'm kind of halfway through making. Let's do this edge. He looks like a better edge to start with. To ease me into the day of welding. Hello? Why you, why you no spark? Try and do all this, but that's not gonna work because my wrist will break. All this. Yeah, probably not gonna do it all in a one but whatever. Okay. 
we didn't do it all in a while. You can call me Mystic Twat because I predict these things. <laughs> Stupidest thing I've ever said. A little bit dirty in places, a little bit not round, but other than that, she's grand. So we've got a hole that this is going to sit on top of, and I'm just cleaning everything up now with this wire brush. And we'll give it another wipe down with acetone, and then we'll weld it. Right, uh, what kind of amps are we at? We're at 105 decibels on the uh, on the TIG weld. <laughs> That's definitely not the right unit of measurement. Should I clean my tungsten? I probably should. She's been through some some stuff, you know. She's seen some shit. Get her on the grinding wheel. Tart her up a bit. Mine. Thank you. You guys are lucky. I'll speed up for you. For me, this is going to take ages. Cool, that will do. And before anyone thinks that you need to critique my welds, right, nothing ever broke on the 350, right? I welded up the whole intercooler, all the intake pipe work, oil sumps for the turbos, tons of stuff, nothing ever cracked. The whole exhaust manifold, all the downpipes, everything, nothing ever cracked, nothing ever leaked. So even though they might not be the prettiest, I'm pretty confident in them not being, uh, not being bad welds structurally, so. Give it a rest, internet welders that are gonna tell me the shit. I did spend some time cleaning this, but you can't tell, it's welding like shit. Dirtier than your mum. When I started making this, I was like, I'm gonna take so much care of this and like not scratch any of it, scuff it while moving it around. And then about 10 minutes in, that, that disappeared. All right, so this is the finished thing. Not super happy with a lot of the welds as usual, but at the end of the day, I'm not a professional fabricator, so I guess it's kind of to be expected. But yeah, we've got the port on the top, which I mentioned is going to be for manipulating the pressure, so we can pump air in and out of there. Um, we don't actually ever need to relieve pressure from here because I found a radiator cap that has that built in. So when you lift that lever, it actually releases pressure and lets it come out of here. So yeah, that's kind of a nice feature. Um, but we can still use this to pump pressure in and to check the pressure in the whole system. We've got these two parts on the side at the top that are gonna be for the running bleeds from the radiator and the swirl part. We've got the sight glass thing that I mentioned before, and the part off the bottom that's gonna go to the inlet of the electric water pump and then get sent back into the engine. And then this part on the side here is gonna be for if we ever decide to water cool the turbos, we can uh, have them return into here again at the top. So yeah, hopefully, that is, that is a job done. Obviously, I still need to mount it, so we're gonna to have to weld some kind of bracket onto the back here. Right, so we're just figuring out exactly where we're gonna mount all this stuff. Um, we're thinking, it's a bit awkward because of the roll cage, like we we're gonna mount it off there, but then the bottom part of it's really weird. So we're thinking now we're gonna mount like a bracket off here and then one bit off the roll cage. Don't know if you're actually allowed to weld bits onto your roll cage. Well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. As in, we'll we've come to it. Yeah, as in we'll just do it. And this then... is that bridge. <laughs> We'll do it and see if the bridge collapses, that's what we're thinking. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to mount that somewhere like that with a load of bracketry. And cue, cue montage of making bracketry. Montage, 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 montage. montage. It's going to be on the piss, but otherwise I'm not going to be able to weld the bottom bit, so I think we go semi on the piss. It's not going to look that weird, is it? Nah. We can always flatten this edge, can't we? Yeah, that'd be great. It'll make it look pretty. Yeah, you did it! Ah, it's fucking hot. <coughs> Jesus Christ, that suddenly, suddenly gets to you. That looked so professional for a second there. <laughs> yeah, it was like, done. oh great, nice weld. Ow, I'm burning. Mate, that is a good tack as well. Good or todgy, that. that I mean, it's good, it's a shapely tack. It's not on the right plane in any way that we wanted it, but uh, you know what? It's staying there now. Stop it. I'm not so bad at going downhill. 
Most people prefer welding downhill, but I can't fucking do it. I mean, it's doing something, and it? It, it ain't coming off. Okay. Oh, there's a load of smoke coming off that. Yeah, I ain't got a bit of the paint. Throw it a bit. Back a little. Montage. Gotta be on whatever you. Fucking we ain't tightened that up properly, have we? Yeah, but it's just shit. <laughs> as soon as it go and gets tough, it just pusses out. Nearly ripped my arm. Wild. Right, now tighten it. Montage! That's a nine. You're a nine. Out of a hundred. You fucking rotter. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> I don't like it when it makes eye contact. <laughs> Done. She nutted. Go on, give it some bed. No, because it's <laughs> going to rip my fucking fingers off. Oh, she's ready. She's crowning. You see that? <sighs> Nailed it. Never doubted it. Why have you made such a mess? Right in the face. I think I've got COVID now, thanks. That's solid. Don't go anywhere. You can probably shake the whole car with that. You can. Right, so this one's pretty much done now. It's real solid. Um, we just need to tidy some of this up so it doesn't look such a mess. But she's pretty much grand. So now we're moving on to the swirl pot, which is coming from the engine into there, swirling around, going into the radiator. Uh, we've just got two hoses that we joined together here, and then we're just going to basically do the same thing again that we did over there. Just mark somewhere on the roll cage where we want to have a tab come off. I think about there somewhere. We'll just do a little line just so I can see, and then we'll start flapping that back and welding it. <laughs> you cunt. You were laughing at me. Yeah. You were fucking laughing at me. I was laughing at you because I know it happens. Nonce. Love to see it. Don't put your thumb on that. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. I thought that was never going to end. That's <laughs> what she said. <laughs> it's the opposite of what she said. Weirdest fucking angle. Ah, falling down and I can't get up. Brian did a mess up. Mess. <laughs> because it's like fucking 3 a.m. It's barely midnight, you funny. <laughs> Shut up, old man. You can't even do a kickflip. I can do a kickflip. Right, I need to hold on to my old man bar I'll to do it. it. Once you've done this. Prove that you can do a kickflip. I can do it. I can do a kick. Come on, then, you nonce. Let's do this kickflip. We'll You've been it. giving it the large. If you do another shove it, I swear to God. <laughs> Fucking shove it! Mate, do not get it. I'm, only, I'm gonna hold on to the old man bar because I don't feel super confident. Oh. Come on, you can do it. I believe in you. Yay! Still got it. I definitely don't dare do it without holding on to something. <laughs> That's how old and frail. Oh, hard parked. It's just how we stand, mate. You won't understand. You're not a skater. It's just how. <laughs> no, it's terrifying. <laughs> You're gonna do a kickflip. <laughs> no. Right. So we've got the swirl pot mounted. It was a bit of an ordeal. Bryn drilled a few holes in the wrong places. It's fucking all over the shop. <laughs> He's not even trying to deny it. That's how you know it's bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're. I think we're pretty good. Give her. Give her a wobble. Give her a tug. Yeah, he's not putting much effort in there because he's worried that it's going to move a lot. But yeah, no, she's fine, she's fine. Because you're going to have two hoses, obviously, attaching to her as well. So that should be good. But yeah, we're okay. We tidied this up a little bit, so it's looking a little bit better. Still a few more bits to, to make look more presentable, but you get the idea. Oh, fun, man. <laughs> oh, fun. So, because we're running rear radiator, I'm going to murder you. <laughs> sure. Selfish cunt. So in order to get the coolant from 
front of the car to the back where the radiator now is. Um, the standard 350Z has a rail on the back that attaches between the two heads and then a hose that comes forward into the radiator. That's not really much use to us because it means that we would have to do sort of a, a U-turn and then go down the back of the engine. But fortunately, at some point, Chris had fitted this Pathfinder mod to the 350Z, which is terrible and don't do it. But what that does mean is that the standard hose would have come off the side here. He's cut that off and, and welded it up. But there's this extra um, inlet to this rail at the back of the engine that comes from the middle of the block on the Pathfinder setup. Now we can use this now. Instead of using that hose, we can actually put a little housing, here's the 3D print test one, on there and then put our dash 20 line off this housing to go back down the footwell, under the footwell there, and into the lines that will go to the back of the car. So I'm just gonna pause the video here because we didn't really do any kind of segue into the next clips that you're gonna see. And basically the red plastic thing that Bryn's got in his hand there, that was the 3D printed prototype as he explained. And a few days ago, he actually did the machining of the aluminium version. So he filmed a few clips of that and that's what you're gonna see next. And then we'll come back to the kind of present day stuff that we were doing. Okay, so the other bit of machining that we've got to do is turning this bit of aluminium into this little rear water neck or something roughly resembling it. Um, now I should point out, I am not a machinist. Uh, I'm a design engineer and I program some of the machining for our CNC machines, but my job is not machining. This is gonna be by far the most complicated thing I've ever machined myself. Okay, here we are machining the main bore. Set the cutter out to the radius that we want. 9.22 at this point, so I'm just doing roughing cuts. And wind this little handle around in a circle. Okay, so that is the end of operation one. Uh, finished slightly early because I got a little bit aggressive over here and it slipped out of the clamps. So it's not not dead round <laughs> anymore. Um, but it slipped out in the way that's fine. I can, I can doctor that up later on. So this is the bottom side now currently. So the next thing that will happen is this will get flipped over and I'll start machining in the top shape and with the final positions for the bolts. Then I'll stick it up on its end and bore this out here. Um, starting off with drills, because drills are a nice way to move a lot of material from a hole. And then we'll go on to an end mill and start slotting out this hole uh, because uh, I've fallen out with this. It's a dick. The, the clamps don't hold it as well as a vice would. So anything I can do in just plain XY is, is gonna be better. So I'm going to try and do this hole like that. If needs be, I can put it on that at the end and just skim out the stuff that isn't round, but I'll basically do it with a big cutter and a series of moves to kind of slot that out. It doesn't make that noise, that's me. So there's the one side hacked out, plus a little bit of free hand corner cutting. Just about to head over to the other side. Don't need to do anything on the back because this bit of material was already about the correct length. So I've skimmed the front instead. So I'll do this side now and then while it's set up like this, I may as well drill the, the two side holes. Now I'm going to be very careful on that because I was originally going to do them on up one. So the dimensions for them are backwards. And so I need to double, triple and quadruple check that I do not put those the wrong way round. And there we have the finished result. This will be the water outlet for the back of the engine. Got a bleed screw here. And the two bolt holes for the original bolts. Um, well, they're going to be longer because I've left quite a lot of meat on this. I'm pretty happy with how that's come out really. Um, it just needs deburring tomorrow, uh, cleaning up a little bit and then she'll be good to go. Right, this is the thing that Bryn's machine that I think he's already filmed some bits of, so you've just seen that. Um, and this is going to go on here, on the back of the engine block. Once, once you bend all your fuel lines out of the way, <laughs> we're, we're going to change some of that perhaps. Um, but once they're out of the way, that we're gonna weld an AN fitting onto, which will then be the, basically the outlet for the engine coolant to get out of the engine, go to the radiator. 
down there. Yeah, somewhere. Somehow we've got to get stuff down there. But isn't it nice not having a throttle body here? Hmm? Two grand well spent. <laughs> we've just started mocking up where all these overflow, well not overflow, but running bleed hoses are going to go. This one's going to be kind of pinned up there somewhere. You get the idea. Uh, the other one's going to be a little bit more awkward because some idiot welded the uh, the bung on to a, a stupid place on the header tank. It would have been nice if it was just there because this would just go nicely straight in there. But because it's got to go in there, it's going to be a little bit more awkward, but we'll figure that out. Um, the only other thing left to do really with the rear is sort out the hole that's going to actually feed the radiator. So we're going to cut a big hole in the rear windscreen, which is going to be, if you just ignore the spinning broom man, um, yeah, that thing. We're not going to actually have any ducting coming from that. We're just going to have a big hole and the radiator is obviously here and the fans obviously suck through that. Now, most people think that you want to have a load of duct into a radiator because airflow and all that, which makes sense. But in drifting, we don't really have any airflow because you do like a 30 second run where you've got some airflow, albeit bad because you're going sideways. So you're not even going like directly into the air. Um, you do a 30 second run and then you sit in the queue for 10, 15 minutes. And that's when you've got to do all the cooling really. So we're kind of basing this all on the fact that the fans are going to do most of the work. And one thing that kind of backs that up is that Forsberg mentioned in some of his videos, which funny enough were on a 370Z, but could have been on anything. He said they've tried all sorts of different ducting and scoops and things feeding into the radiator, and none of it ever made any difference. So that kind of backs up that theory that the fans are the main thing in drifting. Um, because again, airflow, even, even if they have radiators at the front. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the theory behind that. I guess we'll see if we're right or wrong, if it's terrible, but I mean, this cooling system can't be terrible, can it? We've done everything. We've done everything we could possibly do to try and make it good. It can't possibly overheat now. The turbos might melt, but the car should be fine. So that's pretty much it for this one. We've got, we've got a fair bit of progress done, I think, there. And the last thing we've got to do is actually make the lines that are going to come under the car and then come up and meet this, basically. And then the line that's going to come off the water pump and go down there. I'm also going to change this. I think I mentioned that earlier. But yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I don't think I'll bother filming much of actually making the lines because it's pretty pretty boring, but it might be in a future video, who knows? So yeah, that was it. I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Don't do it again. <laughs> Come on. <laughs>